Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Sir Mark. Um, I thought that a part of the investment banking was deleted from my CV at some point, but you, you recall that Joe and I, we were investment bankers. Um, Minister uh, Joe Johnson, congratulations for your appointment. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Um, and it's a pleasure to um, actually keep working with you. And, and so I'm very happy that you were appointed again uh, Minister for Science. Uh, also, uh, a special, uh, um, uh, really, to uh, uh, very happy to see you, the Vice President of the European Parliament, um, Mired McGuinness. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to see you here and other members of the European par Parliament, like Paul Rubik. Um, also, the Royal Highness Princess Sumaya. If you were a European intellectual during the Enlightenment, the chances are that you were a citizen of the Republic of Letters, a community of scholars and literary figures that included the likes of Benjamin Franklin, Goethe, and Voltaire. In Voltaire's correspondence alone, there were nearly 19,000 letters. Voltaire wrote most often to his contemporaries in France, but he also wrote to many others in Germany, in Italy, in Russia, in Switzerland. Across Europe, as universities began publishing academic journals, as royal societies provide patronage to natural sciences, and as new ideas spread from the salons of the nobles to the coffee houses of the bourgeois, the blueprint for modern science was formed. Within the Republic of Letters, natural philosophers shared and critiqued each other's ideas. They sent articles, pamphlets to one another and worked towards expansion of their community by introducing each other and increasing their networks of correspondence. This was a community that transcended national borders, that experimented and debated across disciplines, and that pursued progress and societal advancement by means of rationalism. But though open-minded and meritocratic for the times, the Republic of Letters was a small and privileged community that few people had the means to access. The public was excited by the scientific discoveries of the age, but could play no active role in the process. For me, the Republic of Letters was a little bit like open science for the few. But by the 19th century, the abundance of new areas of scientific exploration required an overall term for men of science. And then the word scientist emerged. The Industrial Revolution and urbanization had brought science into the public consciousness. National governments were funding science. School children were mastering rudiments of physics and chemistry and biology in schools and books on science became bestsellers among increasingly literate populations. Science was now discussed in the laboratory and the lecture hall. Science had succeeded in reaching the professional classes who could marvel at great exhibitions in their leisure time. So the 19th century enlarged the base but for the most part, science was still close to ordinary people. Then it came the 20th century. And the 20th century was about nations, was about individual nations. Individual nations conquered the Everest, achieved space fights, and navigated to the poles. Science was defined by one nation's sprint to the finish line after the other. And scientific institutions and their funding were organized accordingly. Science was then a matter of national pride and national security. More people 
were attending university than ever before, and broadcasting had brought science into people's living room. But still, the public, the public remained an audience to be instructed rather than an active participant in the scientific debate. So how will be the 21st century? The 21st century, I think, will be in between a triangle, a triangle of public, the scientists, and data. And the public will be at the center of it because it will require public support to succeed, it will require public engagement at every step of the way, and everyone will be doing science in a different way. So it is my view that we are entering a new era of global and open science. This will return us somehow to the founding principles of science. And in the 21st century, we can say that we'll not be any more about one nation sprint to the finish line. So it's like in the 17th and the 18th century, the Republic of Letters was open science for the few. In the 21st century, it will become the Republic of Letters for the many. Rather than being an elite activity of the few, concentrating in a few countries in Europe, the 21st century science will involve tens of thousands of scientists working collaboratively across the globe. Equally as important, the relationship with the general public will define science because unlike in the past, each of us now commands more information in our pockets than really any of you, any scientist, could ever read in their lifetime. So these information overloads requires public trust in scientists to determine fact from fiction. Trust that will be built on integrity and objectivity of scientists and that will depend on good communication. Therefore, the persistent historical division between the intellectuals and the non-intellectuals, which I described earlier, is one that every scientist and every politician should be worried about. Though globalization provides the international integration that makes it possible for countries to work together on global challenge, like climate change and migration, in its current form, it has fallen short of benefiting the majority of people. A scientist can explain how renewable energy can help to combat climate change. But how does it help someone who cannot afford to heat their home? A politician can explain the net benefits of migration. I've done it myself a lot of times. But how does that help someone who cannot get a doctor's appointment? The current lack of public and political engagement in fact-based decision-making makes us, us all wonder, have we entered a post-factual era of democracy? One in which the public identifies with populistic rhetoric and decisions are made actually based on fears and assumptions? because people actually feel that science and politics have left them behind. And that's why I'm so happy to be here, because I want to tell you that it's our job, but it's also your job. We have to ask questions. We have to ask questions about what do we have to do? How do we build trust? How do we clear, actually, the idea that we are transparent? that people know our process, that people know how science works. And how do we really ensure progress in this triangle of data, of public, and scientists? And I believe that many of the answers lie in open science. Open access to data, research integrity, 
and citizen science will be part of the answers. Open access to data creates trust and transparency, and we need that. Research integrity guarantees trust and the public acceptance, and citizen science creates closeness between the people and the scientists. But let's start with open access to data and research integrity. The future of our knowledge economy will rely on public access to data so that the European public can take part in the scientific debate, that the public can directly access scientific evidence on the issues they care about. People don't know what's open data or open access to data or open access at all. You know it, I know it, but they don't know it. But when you tell the story to people that very recently in San Francisco, an experience was made with deep learning and where the system was 50% better than a group of 10 experts in radiology and that the deep learning system got zero false negative when detecting lung cancer and that the specialist got it wrong 7% of the time, then people understand data because it's their life. And so the question is how you put this message in a way that people outside of this room understand. And that is, has to be with examples, with their life. But then people, they have doubts because the greater availability of these data comes to the need to ensure the integrity of what's being shared. The public needs to know that research results are not falsified fabricated or plagiarized. And it's really why we're putting so much focus on research integrity in Horizon 2020 on our model agreements. And I'm very happy to announce today that the grant agreements for Horizon 2020 have been updated. They will include clear rules on research integrity, making sure that all researchers, but also research institutions, know their obligations because it's not just about the individual researcher or the scientist, it's also about the institution and the responsibility of that institution. And this brings me to citizen science. We also need to find ways for the European public to take part in the process behind scientific discovery, to help them to be part of what decisions are we making to help them decide the priorities for public research funding so the European scientific community can crowdsource solutions with the volume and diversity to provide new insights. Take, for example, the potential of gaming to help scientists multiply the number of brains working on a single problem at any given time. Five years ago, gamers famously resolved the structure of an enzyme that causes an AIDS-like disease in monkeys. Scientists had been working for decades on this problem, but by using an online puzzle game, gamers solved the structure in just three weeks. This is the kind of stories that people understand. So to ensure that Europe leads the way on open science, I can announce that from today, the Commission has made open data the default for all Horizon 2020 projects. And this morning, just this morning, I've received the news that we have approved the next set of calls under Horizon 2020. It's 50 calls, 8.5 billion euros in 2017, in areas that range from food security to smart cities to understanding migration for all projects funded by these calls, we will expect the data generated to be open access. We will lead by example. So we will put ourselves on that position because we believe that's the future. And I'm currently working with colleagues in the Commission on our proposed revision on the EU copyright law. The aim is to introduce a research exception in copyright 
that will apply across all member states and which will provide a predictable legal framework for tax and data mining. In simple words, that you can tax and data mine without being worried of copyrights. The trends towards open science and open data are not something we can stop. We have to embrace. So we would really and we should lead that change rather than adapt to it later. Yesterday I was uh, sitting in between uh, Sir Venki and Brian Schmidt um, and I texted my wife saying that I was having dinner in between two Nobel Prizes. Um, and uh, we were talking exactly about data, talking about how data is important and how the future will be not just about the scientists, but how you make all this data work. And uh, Brian Schmidt was talking about dark energy, and I think, as I've heard when I went to the Bioinformatics Institute in uh, Heidelberg, there's also a lot of dark matter in data, and we have to transform that dark into a more clear data, but making it to the next level. And that's why we are investing also on this idea of a European science cloud. So, of course, talking about Horizon 2020 here in the UK, I know there's a great deal of uncertainty about what the future holds. I've heard concerns about British organizations being dropped from the EU projects. There are concerns about EU staff working in British research institutions. And I wish I could give you all the answers, believe me. But for now, I can make two clear statements. First, that for as long as the UK is a member of the European Union, EU law continues to apply. And the UK retains all rights and obligations of a member state. These, of course, includes the full eligibility for funding under Horizon 2020, and no one should have any doubt about it. But more importantly, Horizon 2020 will continue to be evaluated on the base of merit and excellence, not on nationality. I think that's the major difference that we make in Europe, is that we have a program that has never been based on nationality, it has been based on excellence. So I urge the European scientific community to continue to choose their project partners on the base of that, on the base of excellence. And I think that that is clear for me, will always be clear for Horizon 2020. So ladies and gentlemen, today my message to you is this. By continuing to allow the gap between public perception and scientific ambition to increase, we risk at best apathy and at worst complete distrust at a crucial juncture. Europe should not only be part of a global research area that embraces open science, we should lead the way to this new global research area. Following the agreement by the EU science ministers in May, Europe is the first region of the world to make open access the norm for all scientific publications. But I haven't seen this in the news. I haven't seen these anywhere. These are the good news, the great things about Europe, but you don't see it. You don't see that 28 people around the table decided that open access to scientific publications will be the norm in Europe but we were not probably able to explain to the people the importance of that for their future. And now, the largest research funding program in the world to introduce open data as a default for all projects. And it's our job, it's your job, it's my job to explain. To explain that somehow we are getting into a new era. A era that I call the new republic of letters. One that is inclusive, one that values its people as much as progress, and one that restores trust and confidence in science. Thank you very much.